the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive This is what 
what it feels like to just walk away from everything I thought keep me safe to depend just on you for every meal and find it's better this way oh it's better this way very much and and the best advice I had was enjoy every single moment good or bad it's all good when they're taking their nap make sure your house is sort of noisy so that they get used to that and you can do anything you want while they're taking their nap you know what else works mm. Benadryl oh. <laughs> get as much sleep as you can early <laughs> won't, won't last forever on your knees a lot have fun enjoy the early years because they grow really fast and then they start looking like this try to say hi oh are we on film when i said that it's okay <laughs> cool. lots of love and understanding and video it? games <laughs> video for for who andrew or the baby uh for andrew he needs it okay <laughs> a word of advice Oh, nothing's in the world except in the world. Well, that's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> have to take turns changing diapers. Don't let Bree do all the work, Andrew. Uh, don't leave your child at home by themselves. Enjoy. Enjoy? Yes. Oh, well, it's a blessing for them. Yes, yeah. amen. Uh, my advice to Andrew is whatever uh, Bree says needs to be done, do it. Congrats. Okay, I'm going to have to have a translate now. Yeah, God bless the little baby. You're going to make a great mom and dad. I love you guys. Is his name Jesus? No. Hi. 
<laughs> are you ready? Yeah. Here it goes. How are you? You're the hardest as well. Uh, get your sleep now. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That was before. How they feel? Like, we got the before now. Help! <laughs> uh, start with one. Start with one. One, one is one good. At a time. Yep. See how it goes. Hey, take. Hey. Welcome, hey, baby Benwood. Cool. Oh, right on. Yeah. Get some signs here. Hey, cranes. Hey guys, we love you. Hey, Adira. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Do you have any advice for Andrew and Bree being new parents? Do they have a milk bottle already? A what? Milk bottle. Milk bottle. So. A crib. And they have a crib. What, do you think what else? A milk bottle, you crib. What else do you need? Baby blanket. I know. Congratulations. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. see me, seeing as we're, you know, in the same, in the same boat. boat as uh, July 8th. 8th. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we need to send this video to you with each other. Yeah, please. Come on. <laughs> hey, good job decorating your car. Thank well, you. I mean, you went to great lengths. Hustling and turning all week, all night, which means I'm up and getting kicked and hit all night. And so it's, hey, yo. it's too late for my advice. It would have been don't have kids. Sleep as much as you can. I'm just kidding. Man, that was so harsh. We love you, Nathan. That was harsh, Nathan. <laughs> Nick, how are you? Good. Breathe and be patient. Okay. Um, cool. Well, good to see you both. Yeah. One of the things that people need to remember is that you need to let children do for themselves what they can do for themselves. Don's like, yeah. What, what, what she said. <laughs> so my advice is that as new parents, everybody has advice. But nobody is you guys. Nobody knows your situation. So feel free to take whatever advice you want and ignore whatever advice you want. Trust your own instincts. I know you can read a lot in, in Christian type books. Oh, pray, just pray. But I really think that you trust your instincts when you're not sure, like, should I do this or should I? Yeah. I, think, I think the Holy Spirit does uh, answer your questions. Hey. Oh. <laughs> We're crying. We taped the wrong we saved the wrong side. How are you? Hey, wait. You gotta be old man here. Yeah. All right. Patience. <laughs> Patience. That's actually not even advice. <laughs> Take the little ones and put them as far back as you possibly can. That is my advice. Don't have kids. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Feed them. Feed them. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's pretty good about it. Take care of your relationship and nurture that. Go on dates and read to your baby. Oh, I think you said with your mask on. No. Hang on a second. Oh. <laughs> what? Hey, Journey family, thank you so much for coming out and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Just the amount of love that you guys poured out on us. We appreciate all the advice. Uh, we're so excited to be parents, and we know that we uh, will need as much help as we can possibly <laughs> get. We love you guys. We miss you guys. Excited to be back in person, hopefully soon, with uh, one more little guy out of the family. Just one in there? Just, just one. one. Just one. I hope just one. Are you sure? <laughs> That'll be just there. One. <laughs> It was a fun day, wasn't it? It was fun. No rain. Yay! No rain. <laughs> it was a good morning altogether. It was. Except the, those guys stood the whole time. I know. I know. That had to be exhausting. So it was you and Kathy, uh, Patsy. Patsy, um, Toya Fitzgerald, Jenny Bellavo. Right. They helped. A lot of people wanted to help, but we didn't really have enough to do. Yeah. Because there was no food or anything. So. So many people came. I know. Great. It's Thank cool. You. Thanks for coming. Well, good morning. We're glad you're here with us at journeyoc.com or on the Facebook page or on YouTube. It was a great day at the shower. Thanks for being involved. It was fun to have you send your selfies in this week. <laughs> As part of this journey selfie video thing. 
Remember, we got this one from Anthony Fitzgerald out in Illinois, which inspired me to have you send yours in. And here's mom. She sent hers in last week. <laughs> hey, mom. The Clantons watching from their living room, feet up in their PJs. Man, what a good way nice. to watch a service. It looks like worship to me. And here's Pete with Jennifer and me. <laughs> and all of the Wilsons with Chris Dickens. <laughs> And then you remember the shepherds sent theirs in? Well, here's the Wilsons with the shepherds and with Steve. <laughs> the Wilsons got really creative. <laughs> they did. <laughs> so send your survey, your service selfies. Man, it's hard to say. Just call them surveys. <laughs> send, your, send your service <laughs> selfies to my email. It's on the screen now. It's jeremy at journeyoc.com. I showed you that one of mom. I also got this picture from Pennsylvania. It is spring-like here, but not up there. They're having a nor'easter this week and are living through feet of snow. Man, I remember those times. And you're jealous, aren't you? I am a little jealous. <laughs> That's your favorite. I do love this California weather, except when I get those pictures, because I love the snow. And you like being snowed in. A snow day is the best. <laughs> It is. They might not know what a snow day is, though. I know. This past week, I tried to convince Steve to give us a day off from staff <laughs> meeting, and I sent him a text that said, snow day? And he sent me a text back saying, oh, well, maybe we can get it done so you can get to the snow. And I was like, no, that's not what snow day means. <laughs> it means we're off. But then he said something about smog day. He's like, oh, yeah, we used to have smog days here, which is... That is not as fun. That's depressing. You can't build a, snog, a smog man. <laughs> I guess you could. I don't, Maybe. Know that, I don't know that you could. That's nasty. Hey, I want to tell you about this prayer meeting that we're having tomorrow night. This is, um, in my opinion, maybe the coolest thing we've been doing since coronavirus has kept us from meeting together in person. We've been getting together on Zoom every once in a while. While we, We'd like to make it a monthly thing, if that's possible. Um, you can email Patsy and get the Zoom information and then get together with us tomorrow night for uh, a prayer meeting at 6.30 p.m. for about an hour. We'll spend maybe the first 20 minutes or so um, praying for our community as a whole and for our country. And then we'll break off and pray for our own prayer needs in small groups. Zoom can randomize us. And so we get put with people maybe we wouldn't even know. That happened to me a couple of times. And uh, if you have any prayer needs, this would be a great time for you to get prayed for. The staff will be there and the elders and then anybody else who decides to join from Journey. It's just a really cool time. It's really cool. It's very special. You had said too that you just love these. Yeah, I mean, you don't think that you can have feel the power of the Spirit through prayer over Zoom, but it really is powerful. Super cool. So join us tomorrow night at 6.30. Be sure to email Patsy. Let her know that you're coming and get the Zoom information from her. Okay, take a minute. Relax your shoulders. Wherever you're watching, whether it be on your computer on your TV, like the Clantons with your feet up, mm -hmm. or lucky enough to be watching from bed. Just sink down into it. You don't need to be anywhere else right now. You're here, you might as well really be here, right? of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. 
When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. She, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil would not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. There were some tongue twisters in there. I know. You know what cracks me up about this verse? <laughs> that she may eat it and no. die. Well, that. <laughs> but as she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and bring me a piece of bread. I know. That is such a man thing to do. All right. And make me sandwich while you're at it. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this day and for a chance to get together, even virtually online here, and look at your word. To spend some time in the Bible, in this story, and see what it might have for us. Thank you that you do miracles. You did them then and you still do them now. And we come in expectation. Well, good morning, friends. We're so glad you've joined us uh, for this online gathering here today. Uh, from wherever you're watching, you are part of this journey community and we are here for each other. So if you've not connected with us yet, or uh, if you'd like to now, please go to the website at journeyoc.com and click the My Response button. Just let us know that you're on the journey toward God with us and check the box that indicates how we can help you in your spiritual journey. Uh, there's also a prayer request button on that page where you can communicate your confidential prayer requests to our elders and pastors. And however you respond, we'll get back to you this week. In fact, you know, I talked with two families this week who responded recently through that My Response. One retired couple who recently moved to this area and another couple with an 11-year-old daughter who are also new to the area and to uh, the United States. So it was a joy to meet them over Zoom and share our stories. Hopefully, you'll meet them soon as well. And speaking of meeting together, uh, we are opening our in-person outdoor service at Journey on February 21st as we begin the season of Lent. And I know you all miss seeing each other as much as I do. And for those who can, you're invited to be part of Journey Outside at 11 a.m. each Sunday beginning two weeks from today. Uh, we've changed it up a bit. Bring your own lawn or folding chairs. Uh, there won't be any pre-registration, but of course everyone will still need to wear a mask. Uh, family groups need to be keeping six feet from each other, and uh, you still need to be screened for being healthy at the check-in center where you can pick up resources uh, for the service. Stay tuned for more details about that, but let's work together to get together as a church family because it's going to be great. Uh, one other thing, small group sign-ups start this week, so anyone can sign up for one of these seven-week groups that start next week and go until Easter. I'm super stoked about the groups that we'll be tracking with the Sunday teaching because we're going to be doing Journey of the Soul, which is based upon the soon-to-be-released book by the same title, written by Journey's good friends and advisors Bill and Christy Galtier. Now, this is a very practical roadmap to the life of following Jesus, and it really distills many of the principles of Journey's mission into a very concise framework that's super easy to understand. Uh, it also addresses many of the roadblocks that we all encounter as we grow in Christ. It's truly life-changing. So I'm praying that everyone will join a group. 
Uh, and, and due to an arrangement with the publisher, the books are available to journey at half price, which is $9. Both paperback and electronic versions are going to be available at that price once we receive the shipment, which is going to be sometime this week. So watch your email for more details. We'll soon have a link up on the website under the Give tab where you can pay online and then pick up your book at the church. Okay, well, let's jump into the message with this question. Do you remember the wildfires in 2020? Oh yeah, that happened too last year. Now do these pictures from late October bring back any memories? You know, it was the worst wildfire season in California on record with over 4.1 million acres burned, which is double the previous record. 31 people were killed, over 10,000 buildings damaged. And locally, the Blue Ridge and Silverado fire in October had many of us scrambling to evacuate. Here's what it looked like from our house when that Silverado fire began. Uh, people whose homes were threatened had to quickly evacuate and evaluate priorities when it came to possessions. And because the evacuation zone was a block away from us, my family went through that drill. And let me tell you, it's a wake-up call. Uh, I heard a story on NPR that really captures this dilemma. Sabina Mayo Smith and her seven-year-old daughter and her nine-year-old son were chased out of their Topanga Canyon home by the fires raging near Malibu. And she said the hard thing about the evacuation was deciding what to take with them. And so she told her children to pack what was most important to them, especially the things they couldn't easily replace. Well, her son was having a hard time deciding. He was kind of frozen in the process, just, you know, looking around the room. And finally, he stopped and blurted out, are you just going to let all this stuff burn? And that question stopped his mother. Are you just going to let all this stuff burn? And she finally replied, well, yes, this stuff might burn. And like some of you, that family had two hours to decide what was most important to them, what they were unwilling to lose. And fortunately for them, their home was saved. But her son's question, are you just going to let all this stuff burn, should really be directed to all of us. And in the final analysis, the answer is yes. This stuff will burn, yours and mine, all of it. Here's what Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord, it will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. This stuff will burn, and it seems likely you'll have more than two hours to make up your mind, but it's still time to decide what's important in your life. So, A New Decision is the title of today's message, and here's what Theodore Hesburgh writes about decision-making. My basic principle is you don't make decisions because they are easy, you don't make them because they're cheap, you don't make them because they are popular, you make them because they are right. And today the Holy Spirit is calling us to make a series of right decisions. And here's the first one, decide to humble yourself and follow God's plan. Now this is illustrated from an ancient story in 2 Kings, Naaman was an illustrious army commander serving the king of Aram, Syria today, and he had contracted leprosy. Well, he had a slave girl taken from the conquering of Israel, and she told him about the prophet Elisha who could heal his leprosy. So Naaman asked the king of Aram to let him go, and the king grants him permission and sends a gift of much gold and silver and clothing to the king of Israel who was now under his rule. Well, he also sends a letter instructing the king of Israel to cure Naaman of his leprosy. And as you might expect, this throws the Israelite king, Joram, into a panic. And he starts ripping his clothes, which was a symbol of great distress. We pick it up in 2 Kings 25, 9. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry, and he said, 
I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and they said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept now a gift from your servant. So a Syrian shoulder shows us how to obey when we don't understand. My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? So the first lesson is no one is immune from problems. It doesn't matter if you're the commander of an army, the CEO of a corporation, or a Hollywood celebrity. No one is immune from problems. Naaman had leprosy. What is your problem? The second lesson is that God will use the most unlikely sources to supply our need. For Naaman, God used a servant girl to lead him to the cure of his problem. The third lesson, what God asks us to do is not always what we want to hear. And isn't that interesting? It won't usually be what we want to hear. Elisha told Naaman, go down and dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And Naaman thought, what, the foul, dirty Jordan River? Lesson four, we are always tempted to substitute our way for God's way, to come up with our own plan. Too often, God tells us to do something in a certain way, and we'll say, yeah, okay, but I'm going to try it this way. Or we'll modify what he tells us. Naaman got angry at what he had been told, and he came up with his own plan. He said, the rivers of Damascus are far nicer than the rivers of Israel. Lesson five, God's way is always the right way. Naaman eventually did what God told him to do, and he was healed. You see, there's great security in obedience. You'll never obey God and regret it. It will never happen. I've never heard anyone at the end of their life say, I wish I wasn't so faithful in my life. But I've heard many times, I wish I could do it again. I wish I would have lived more for him. Well, 1 Kings 17, the story read earlier, models our next decision, and that is decide to be unafraid. And this story involves Elijah, the mentor of Elisha, and God had instructed Elijah to go to the widow and have her feed him. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and, and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Well, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Her life was over. Her husband was dead. Her son was sick. Her resources were exhausted. Her hope was gone. She was ready to eat her last bit of food with her son and wait to die. And that's when God sent Elijah into her life with this outrageous request, Give me your last meal and trust God. So this city and night woman wasn't even part of God's people, but she shows us how to trust even when we are uncertain. Elijah said to her, remember, don't be afraid. So we're applying this story to our lives, specifically in the decisions we make about financial giving to the church. And there are some sobering lessons here. The first one, God expects everyone to give, even in hard times. 
You know, when I preached about tithing a couple years ago, I received this note from a member who had really been struggling. He says, Steve, I'm really enjoying this series. I believe the reason that a man or a father or a husband or provider does not tithe is fear, fear of lack for his family. This desire to protect and provide for one's family is God-given, and only God can remove this fear. I began tithing when I honestly believed that Jesus' sacrifice freed me from this fear and all fears we experience in this life. The truth that God blesses those who give is real. I've experienced it in my life. But before I could experience this, I had to let go of that fear of lack and let the Father take care of me and my family. He has set me free to give. Well, the second lesson, God expects us to give to him first. Remember, the widow fed Elijah first, then fed herself and her son. And this is what faith in action looks like. The third lesson is that God promises to meet our needs when we trust him and give. Look at verse 15. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Well, I'm thinking of so many stories of people who have put God to that test and have seen him come through in ways that are beyond coincidence. You know, for Kathy and me, he has blown our minds so often over the years. But more about that later. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the third decision is to decide to live with an eternal perspective. In Mark 12, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Now, many rich people, they were throwing in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow, has put more into the treasury than all the others, for they all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So a Jewish widow shows us how to invest even when we are poor. She, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Well, the first lesson here is that God can be trusted when you step up to your giving potential. This poor widow was impoverished, and she gave God everything she had. Others were wealthy and simply gave out of their surplus. Jesus said the widow woman gave the best gift. So let's examine our reality, our giving potential here today. You drive onto any church parking lot like ours on a non-pandemic Sunday morning, and you will conclude Christians have to be among the very best money managers on earth. You would see BMWs and Benzes, Excursions and Escalades, Lincolns and Teslas, and the list goes on. We tend to drive really nice cars. And before the pandemic every week, more than 150 vehicles drove right here onto Journey's parking lot. Now, according to the Kelly Blue Book, the average cost of a new car in 2020 was $37,876. The average price of a used car was $27,689. That means at least that a whopping $4,153,350 worth of metal, glass, rubber, and leather come pulling into our parking lot every Sunday morning during normal times. I mean, that's about what this entire property's worth. Or look at our homes in Orange County, the median price, $800,000 conservatively. Take 100 times 800,000, that's 80 million. Or our income in Orange County, median income, $95,761. Well, if all 175 families were tithing, just based upon that median income, that would equal $1,675,800. Journey's giving potential is far from being realized. Lesson two is Jesus' challenge, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. 
Now, he advocated that we invest in a much longer term than this life in Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want you to think about this challenge, to lay up treasure in heaven. First, Jesus said, do this for yourself. It's for our benefit to give and to lay up treasure in heaven. Secondly, how do we lay up treasure in heaven? Well, Jesus says we lay up treasure in heaven by our giving. Luke 12, 33 says, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief comes near, and no moth destroys. You know, two weeks ago, I shared with you how Alicia Gentili, a widow and polio survivor here at Journey, needed $5,000 to cover her copay for a $25,000 motorized wheelchair. And once again, the generous donors at Journey came through, delivering the needed five grand within 24 hours. <laughs> that smile says everything. Oh, and Alicia wanted me to let you know that she's praying for all the donors to receive blessing a hundredfold and running over treasure in heaven. I also think about a man who called us last week with an urgent need. His wife had experienced a stroke and was now bedridden in recovery. They have four children under the age of 10, and he had to stop working in order to care for her and the kids. Having no vac vacation, no unemployment, he couldn't cover his expenses. So he asked, as a complete stranger, if we at Journey could help. After vetting his story, and I'm happy to report Journey's Benevolence Fund met his need, and his family has provision for another month. Treasure in heaven. What kind of return does God provide on our heavenly investments? Well, the Bible uses agriculture to teach us something in this area. You know, spending my summers as a kid on farms in Tennessee, I gained some insight into that farming lifestyle. And, and while Farmers often complain about too little rain, too much rain, decreased government subsidies, the energy costs, the land costs, labor costs, equipment costs. They don't complain about the cost of seed. Seed, once it's purchased and planted, it doesn't depreciate or disappear. It does just the opposite. It multiplies. It returns a yield much higher than itself. Seed, in fact, is the key to the entire agricultural enterprise. And money for seed, then, is not an expense, it's an investment, the most important of all. When you sow two bushels of wheat, you can expect to reap 67 bushels at harvest. That's a, more than a 33 to 1 return. And for every grain of corn you plant, you can expect to reap 700 grains at harvest. That's an incredible return of 70,000%. And that is the amazing, miraculous principle of increased and all of us who've ever planted a home garden, we've experienced it, right? Just plant a few zucchini seeds in your backyard and see what happens. You're going to have zucchini coming out of your ears. Well, the principle of investment and the principle of increase, they go together. It works like this. The generosity of your investment determines the extent of your increase. As 2 Corinthians 9, 6 puts it very well. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. God says we're to view giving as a farmer views his seed. Don't view giving as a debt you owe, but as a seed you sow. Giving's not an expense, it's an investment. So what kind of return does God provide on our heavenly investments? And again, Luke 6, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use... It will be measured to you. So here at Journey, your gifts are being invested in heavenly treasure. You know, one of the ministries supported from your donations is clothing the homeless. And this week, I received a call from Joshua. Now, Joshua was a math teacher in Washington who graduated magna cum laude from Eastern Washington University. But 10 years ago, he sensed God calling him to leave that profession and live among the homeless to serve them in his devotion to following Jesus. And Joshua was obedient to that call, and he has built an impressive advocacy coalition for people experiencing homelessness in Spokane, in Las Vegas, in Venice Beach, and now in Orange County. 
He's been arrested countless times for protesting, and he's been instrumental in bringing protective legislation at city and county levels. And you can learn more about his organization, which is Homeless Advocates for Christ, on Facebook. And we just posted his story to our Clothing the Homeless pages as well. But when Joshua heard about Clothing the Homeless, he called me. He asked if we had any clothing he could take to people as he encounters them on the streets and under bridges. And this is his full-time work. So I connected him with Mitch Rath, Clothing the Homeless director. And we loaded up his truck Saturday and his cab to the brim with whatever he wanted. And our hope is that this is the beginning of a fruitful partnership in the name of Jesus, together working to ease the suffering of those that Jesus most identified with. Your donations to Journey, treasure in heaven. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. One more example is from Journey's children's ministry. You know, we had to eliminate the children's pastor position from Journey staff due to the decrease in giving. But that doesn't mean the kids' ministry has stopped. In fact, a team of volunteers have agreed to serve as an oversight committee to keep that ministry going. And most of this team are parents, you know, struggling just like everyone else, yet they are giving of their time and their energy to serve all the families of Journey. They are sowing seed, investing in heaven. And I'm just so proud of this group, including my wife, Kathy, as she facilitates this team. They've all made a decision to serve. So a big thank you to the Campsons and the Harpers and the Kings and the Mationgs and the Roybles and the Skirvins and the Smiths and the Vivars. I mean, what an amazing team. And of course, they will need to be provided a budget to use as Journey reaches out to families while we move forward toward resuming in-person kids programming. And investing in the faith formation of kids is investing in a heavenly treasure. So follow God's plan and you can be sure of this. There is hope for your future. God wants you to grow to a place of abundance and freedom. And it's not so much about dimes and nickels as surrender and trust. Am I willing to honor God? Am I willing to follow his financial principles for my life? Do I trust him? You're never going to regret, regret obeying God and doing what's right. In fact, the Bible inspires us to never tire of doing what's right. And doing what's right means we leverage our finances to accomplish God's purpose. In Luke 16, 9, Jesus said, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus was saying to use our money to reach every person we can with the gospel. And one day... They will welcome us into heaven. You know, if you want an out-of-this-world return on your investment, that's the way to get it. So the question for us today is, have I decided to trust God in my finances? Have I decided to do it God's way? Or will we be like Naaman, who was at first wanting to do it his way, to be healed in the waters of Damascus? Generous giving is God's way for any disciple of Jesus, because generosity is possible, see, no matter how much or how little you have. Remember the widow's two coins. God talks about this all through the Bible and through the prophet Malachi, where he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, tithing was a practice unique to Israel. They would take 10% of all of their resources as an expression of trust, and they would give that, bring it to God to cultivate their generosity. None of the ancient peoples around them did this. But God said, trust me in this. Bring the whole tithe, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. I know of no other command from God where he tells people to test him. But it's like he knows how much we wrestle with this. He's almost saying, I dare you. Test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So how are you doing with that? You know, when Kathy and I got married, we said one thing we're going to get right. We kind of put that stake in the ground. We're going to take the first 10% that God sends to us, and we're going to give it back to God. We will tithe. So we made $1,200 a month back then. So 10% meant a $120 tithe. And we are so glad that we continue doing that. Are you doing that? 
Are you trusting God with a tithe? If not, then ask him to help you build a generous heart. And this is why we have what's called the tithing challenge. Here's how it works. If you've never tithed, for the next 90 days, you tithe to God through journey. You bring the full tithe, that's 10%, into the storehouse. And if 90 days from now you are not convinced, if God has not clearly blessed your life, if you believe that this is not sustainable, we will give your money back to you, no questions asked. Now you can read more about this on our website. Just go to Journey's homepage and click the Tithing Challenge button. And you can also sign up for the challenge there as well. You can give online. You can give by check. You can give cash as long as it's in an envelope with your name on it. The only thing you cannot do is not sign up and then come in 90 days and say, hey, trust me on this. I gave $10,000 and I'd like it back. <laughs> we're not doing the honor sister system on this one. The reason we're doing this is so that you'll experience the joy of trusting God with your money. Now somebody asked, well, can I give 10% someplace else and get my money back here if it doesn't work out? No, can't do that. Now, some of you have never heard the tithing concept before. You're new to church. You need time to think about it. I get that. No one should make a financial decision under pressure or when they don't have a full understanding about it. And so if that's you, think about it. Study it. Pray about it. Talk with your family members. And then let us know if you're interested. It's there for you. The most famous Bible verse is that God so loved the world, he gave the best gift he had. See, giving is not a heart deal. It's a heart deal. It's not intended by God as an obligation. It's not intended as a rule to observe, you know, with a grudging spirit. That's why Paul writes to the church at Corinth to give. But not just that. He says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, the Greek word for that word cheerful is hilaros, where we get our word hilarious. Make it an exercise in joy. What a cool thing it would be to have a community so committed to following Jesus that in a culture that says more, 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 now, 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 we just say to Jesus, yours, yours, yours. Here, here, here. How cool would that be? Would you pray together with me now? God, we bring you our whole hearts, our whole lives to you, including our financial lives. We acknowledge, God, this money thing, it's way beyond us. There's way more power in it than there is in us. We get all heated up over it. We think it will make us happy. We think it will bring us security. We think it gives us our identity. And then, God, in moments, reality comes crashing in. Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's a heartbreak. Maybe it's life and death. But we remember then that money is not God. Money doesn't last. It, along with everything it buys, is all going to burn. Money did not die on a cross for our sins. Only you. So God, right now, would you bring the love, the care, the tenderness, the hope, and the comfort that money and success and possessions can never bring, but you can. Would you bring, God, the freedom and the love and the mercy? We thank you for all you give to us. Help us to give like you do, as you gave on the cross. As we take this bread of communion, we remember your words to us in the upper room, Lord Jesus. When you took bread and you blessed it and you broke it saying, take and eat for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way you took the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death 
of the risen Lord until he comes. Well, thanks again for being here with us. If you can find it in your heart to give, this would be a great time. There's a lot of stuff, like Steve already explained, going on at Journey, and we need your help. You can give online at journeyoc.com. You can text to give at the number on your screen right now. Or you can come by the church and drop off a check if you're old school. <laughs> or cash if you have any of that laying around. <laughs> Either way, thanks so much for considering it. Like Steve said, this outdoor service is starting up in two weeks. We're going to give it a shot. Every time we've started one of these up, something has happened where we've been able, where we haven't been able to keep meeting. Um, but this looks like we're at least on the backside of this, so we'll try it again. Hopefully. Hopefully. It's 11 a.m. on the 28th, I think. Is it the 28th? I think it's the 21st, actually. I do too. All right, listen. Whatever's on the graphic that's up right now. <laughs> Go with that. That's what Don't it is. Don't listen to us. Also, remember. I really think it's the 21st. It is the 21st. Also, remember, <laughs> small groups are starting up. You heard about this from Steve and from Bill and Christy. This would be a good time to join. Just email Patsy at patsy at journeyoc.com. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.